That's my story. Uh, my whole story hinges around airplanes. And uh, I was born in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, and the area was Villa Mariana, and the Treff name was quite well known in that particular community because it was a German community that kept to themselves and uh, didn't really mix with the regular population in terms of who they married and friends and so on. Anyway, that was 1923 and my father was an adventurer of sorts and he came to the United States on a lark uh, in 1919 and went to work for the Steinway Piano Factory in Astoria, New York. But went back to Brazil, got married, I was born, and German was the first language I spoke, uh, which was something that was corrected by the New York City uh, Education Department, the school system, I got rid of any German accent I might have had. Okay. My parents had a mixed German-Portuguese accent, and that persisted throughout my whole life. Uh, but when I was a year and a half old, there was yet another revolution in Brazil, and my father said, that's it we're getting out of here, we're going to the United States. So we arrived in New York mm, somewhere around 1925, New York City that is, and uh, naturally went back to his old neighborhood, which was the Steinway section of Astoria. And we were way up north at the end of Steinway Street, although we were on 41st Street, uh, and Steinway Street went to the end of the East River where it emptied into Long Island Sound, and uh, the piano factory had a very, very large lumber yard there, and, and there was a beach called North Beach, and North Beach, at the turn of the century, or a little before, had a amusement park on it called the Gala Amusement Park, and it was quite a sensational place. Uh, steamboat rides from Manhattan used to go there, and so on. But part of my story, again, aviation, I'm just filling in the background. My father used to take me on walks when I was six, seven, eight, nine years old. And we used to walk to what used to be the site of the amusement park. And this was the Glen L. Curtis Airport. And it was a private field. And I think one of the key points of my memory was that one Sunday, summer Sunday, we were walking around towards the airport and we saw the last dance hall out on a pier burned down. That was the last thing that was in that area that was part of the amusement park. Well, there was still a carousel there uh, running. There were still uh, foundations from the roller coasters and everything else. And there were hangers. And by the time I was eight years old, 
I would walk there summer days myself and go up on a hill and that overlooked the airport and I used to watch airplanes. And that was it, airplanes for me. I saw the DOX land and it, the DOX was at Glen L. Curtis, then later known as North Beach Airport. Uh, the DOX was there for one summer when they did an engine change and they took off the 12 German engines that were on top of the wing and replaced them with Curtis Conquerors, which were now one of the first geared airplane engines. And they were V-12s. Yeah, V-12s. Oh, about 600 horsepower apiece. Well, I saw the DOX take off to go back to Germany. I also saw the Hindenburg on the day that it burned. It was flying over New York City. On its way to Lakers, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my. Yeah. So, uh, needless to say, I had propellers in my pants <laughs> from, from, from way back. I can see that. Way back. Well, when it came time to pick a high school, uh, I knew it was not going to be possible for me to go to college. So I went to Manhattan High School of Aviation Trades and graduated as a airplane mechanic. In the process, uh, I also belonged to the glider club, and I guess I had my tail end off the ground for a half a minute or so in a primary glider uh, and flew it, actually, down a gentle hill somewhere in the Pocono Mountains, uh, and the instructor was a, an old German uh, glider pilot, Emil Lehecke, and he was one of the first Silver Sea holders, which meant, I think the requirement was you had to do a cross-country in an engineless glider. Well, that only increased the, the desire to fly, but I built model airplanes and I made a lot of gliders and uh, where we lived later on uh, and I was a teenager, there was a, an old ball field near the uh, East River Gas Company and we used to have model airplane contests there. But when it came time to pick a high school, of course I picked the, oh, I'm repeating myself. I, 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 I picked the Manhattan High School of Aviation Trades. I graduated when I was <clears throat> 17 in 1941. Uh, New York City had uh, split years so I graduated in February or January 1941 and I had a job offered to me that I never I never went to get with went to work at for Pan American Airways at uh, let's see 41 yeah uh, it was now called LaGuardia Field. I had a job there for Pan, with Pan, Pan Am, but I had nine months and I really needed a job, so I went to the engineering employment uh, business in, in Manhattan and uh, got a job as a tracer, a draftsman. And that was, that was the end of uh, B-52 
being an aviation mechanic. From there on in, I got to be a a, uh, a layout man and and so on. And I think. When I was in high school, I finally realized that what I was doing was too easy. I graduated with honors, but it was too easy. So while I was a senior in high school, I went to Bryant High School at night to make up college credits so I could perhaps someday go to college. Well. In 1942, I got classified at 1A to go in the Army, I, I suppose. And there were several of us that uh, decided that we, we better look around and see what else we can do. Well, at that time, President Roosevelt uh, instructed the services to begin training pilots at an accelerated rate, and he wanted to graduate 50,000 pilots a year. So they waived the college requirements for an, uh, an aviation cadet and if you were able to pass a written examination, and of course the physical, uh, you could be an aviation cadet. Well, there were, I guess, four of us that went in to the old Roosevelt Hotel on Lexington Avenue, I think, uh, which became an army base for recruitment and whatever, and I passed the test. So the next day, which was, oh Lord, I had the date on a piece of paper. It was, I think, December 2nd, uh, 1942, uh, that I was sworn in and given a uniform and everything else. And I reported back to the Roosevelt Hotel in January of uh, 43 to go to Atlantic City for infantry training. Well, infantry training for a quote unquote private, buck private, air crew student was the official title given to us, uh, got special attention from the drill sergeants. They, they let us know that we were going to be officers and they wanted to make sure that we were going to be good officers. So we marched in the sand and all the infantry guys marched on the boardwalk. And these, these were drill sergeants that fit the picture everybody's heard about. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were these guys. Well, when we got done with uh, basic training, the services had a problem as to what to do with us because now they were beginning to accelerate the aviation program but didn't have it up to full speed yet. So they sent us to college. I went to Lafayette College oh, around about mm, March April of 43, and we expected to take technical courses for about six months and then go on to flight training. Well, two months later, I was shipped out to uh, Nashville, 
Tennessee to the uh, qualification testing uh, base where we were given all kinds of psychomotive tests and of course several uh, physicals again but uh, at that point we were classified as either pilots navigators or bombardiers I happily was classified as a pilot and uh, I guess we were in the classification uh, center about a month or a month and a half and at the end of that time, I came down with a Vincent's throat and I was put in the hospital for a couple of weeks, which I recovered. But when I got out of the hospital, I was really out of shape. But I got out of the hospital. Two days later, I was on a train going to uh, pre-flight school in Montgomery, Alabama. And the first thing I saw from the train window were upperclassmen waving swords at us. And from that day on, it was double time any time we were in formation. We marched, of course, like all good cadets. But if we were going anywhere, it was double time. And you know what? I got into pretty good shape real I bet. fast. I bet. <laughs> But it was the class system, so uh, all we heard double timing it to our barracks from the upperclassmen is they were yelling at us, I hear eyeballs clicking. You can't look around, mister. You can't buy this place and, and all, all kinds of rattling stuff like yeah. that. And, uh, well, we were underclassmen for a month. And during that month, I had one upperclassman who s singled me out to be his personal project. So one of the things he, he did was uh, talk about the fact that I had a stomach. I didn't have a stomach. I was six feet and I weighed 155 pounds. But he kept asking me for a piece of my belt because he was going to make me nice and slim. So I, I had a second belt. I gave him a piece of my second belt. And he asked me for pieces of my belt about five or six more times during the months that he was the upperclassman, and I kept cutting the other belt and giving it to him. And on the last day, when he was leaving, he called me into the barracks, and he said, Mister, you sure got skinny, didn't you? And he had the six pieces of belt <laughs> laid out, and it, it, was, it was almost a foot and a half. <laughs> Something's not right here. <laughs> But oh boy, the class system, they yell at you and, you know, practically touch your nose to nose. And uh, there are many stories and I, I don't remember very many from uh, pre-flight, but uh, it was an experience. We uh, double timed all the time. Once a week in formation, one hour of double time uh, to a cadence. And once a week, the Burma Road, which was a two and a half mile cross country trail through the woods. And then all kinds of calisthenics and uh, chinning and climbing ropes with your hands only. and all that sort of thing. Just explaining the the gym instructors were were actually real nice guys and they explained look you're gonna have to to uh, 
be able to resist g-forces if you're gonna if you're gonna be a fighter pilot but g-forces that are in your future and you you better be in good shape well I was in good shape then they shipped me to Orangeburg South Carolina uh, in September of uh, 43 and I was now officially in uh, class 44 C which meant I was scheduled to uh, graduate in March of 44 anyway these were BT 17 no uh, oh PT-17s, the Boeing biplane, open cockpit airplane. And uh, I have pictures of Orangeburg taken from the cockpit of a, of a 17. And that was a round field. It was a round field. It had some grass, some sand, and markers. So you could always land a PT-17 dead into the wind because that airplane was a ground looper. Once you got it on the ground, it didn't want to go straight. And one of the most prevalent failures on that airplane was the tail wheel tire because the tail wheel was steerable and if you got the tail down you had to actually kick the rudder and the tail wheel to keep that PT-17 from spinning around and digging the wingtip into the sand. Well, I guess I had about eight hours, I'm not sure, and I was flying with my instructor all that time, learning how to land the, the 17, the steerman. And one day I thought I was doing pretty good. And I, I get it into three-point attitude, and we were supposed to level off a foot off the ground and let it just settle, just drop down on three points. And I, was, I thought I was doing pretty good and I was about to make my last landing when the instructor hit the stick and pushed it forward and it bounced the airplane and then, then of course I had to recover from that which was a matter of applying power getting it flying again and landing it again well I landed it again not so good and the instructor got on the Gosport tube now, a Gosport tube was a rubber tube that he spoke into. He had a, a funnel-like that he spoke into, and it, the Gosport went into your helmet uh, earpieces. Well, he gave me the devil. He yelled at me, and, oh, that was the lousiest landing I ever saw, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he, he, all the way, all the way across the field, uh, I, as I was taxiing, he was giving me a hard time. And finally we get to the upwind side of the field and he says, stop this airplane. I'm getting out. You can go kill yourself if you want. I, and he, he climbs out of the cockpit, uh, closes the, the uh, seat belt, the safety belt, takes his parachute, walks off, and sits on a, uh, a boundary marker. And he says, go on, go kill yourself. Do it three times if you can. <laughs> and I'm taxiing away. I didn't know whether, whether the S or go blind, you know? Yeah. And I, I look up in the, the mirror, the rear view mirror that was up on the wing, and he's laughing away. <laughs> like anything. Well, I made three lousy landings. <laughs> then after that, okay, I was allowed to
practice landings. And then with a little more duel, I was allowed to fly around uh, the area. And uh, finally, I got 60 hours, and, and we had all kinds of fun things we did, like landing stages. Landing stages were done at an auxiliary field, and it was sort of a, a, a practice for short field landings. And what they did was they put a clothesline across the end of the runway at about four feet high. Yeah. And you had to land without touching the clothesline oh, oh as yeah. close as you could. Yeah. And there were other other neat stuff they had us they had us doing. The school in, in Orangeburg was actually originally a uh, flight school for civilians, and the instructors were civilians. But they had some kind of military. Uh, a rank of some sort, and I don't know what it was. My instructor was a guy by the name of Dale Harlan, mm -hmm. H-A-R-L-A-N, I think. Southern boy, and uh, a really nice guy, and I do have a black and white picture oh. of my flight yeah. and Dale Harlan. Excellent. Uh, one of my stories about primary flying school that one of the instructors uh, was a little bit eccentric and he would stand up in the forward cockpit and point at an instrument to the student in the back cockpit by leaning over, standing up in the cockpit, leaning over, pointing. And uh, one day he was doing that in the traffic pattern. And uh, he said, the kid told me about this. He, he was pointing at the altimeter. He's, and uh, he was saying, when I say a thousand feet, I mean a thousand feet pointing at the instrument, the kid turned the airplane upside down and dumped him out. Oh my, okay. And, well, he had a parachute, Shoot. of course. Absolutely. The kid came back, landed, went right into the CO and said, I want another instructor. Oh, okay, interesting. Then the instructor came in with his parachute in his arm, mattering the dickens. Yeah. But he couldn't do anything. Yeah. Because he, he, he made an unauthorized move. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, what a great story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That is, yes. But the, the kid just rolled. It. By, by then, by that time, we had, we had been doing acrobatics. And uh, so, uh, uh, a favorite, uh, some of the favorite things we used to do was one, chase hawks into uh, clouds and then dive around the cloud and watch them spin out of out of the cloud in the bottom <laughs> another thing is to take uh, uh, oh well balloons and uh, blow them up and throw them out and then try to break them with the propeller okay okay oh what else did we do we had all sorts of things right. that we used to do, but buzzing clouds, man, that was that was sheer fun. Yeah, doing loops around clouds and no, oh, all kinds of things. We 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 had more fun with that plane. You couldn't hurt it. Yeah, you yeah. couldn't hurt it. You're still in the steerman, right? In the steerman, yeah. right? Well. Next, I was shipped to Shawfield, Sumter, South Carolina for uh, basic training. And uh, this was in a uh, BT-13, 
a low-wing fixed-gear airplane with flaps, that's new, and a two-speed propeller, and that was new. And you had to crank the flaps down by hand to uh, land the BT-13. And it was called the Volte Vibrator because in doing acrobatics, that airplane would do the slowest snap rolls I ever saw. All you had to do was just lift the nose a little and just push the rudder pedal in and it would go around in a snap roll. Yeah. And it, you couldn't get two snap rolls out of it. You could get one and a half yeah. and then of course you had to recover from a dive or something. But uh, it was called a Volte Vibrator for that, part, for that reason. But one of the uh, features of uh, basic flying school was uh, flying formation. And we used to take off and land in formation with an instructor. Two students and an instructor mm -hmm. take off, wing clearance and all of that, but you had to hold your position while taking off and you had to hold your position while landing and you had to land it uh, three points. Okay. Uh, and another requirement that uh, was new was we used to have to practice uh, power off landings where on the downwind leg when you got opposite the numbers of the runway, you chop the throttle and then you were obliged to try to hit the numbers on the runway without using any power. Fun. And there was night flying. And night flying uh, actually claimed a couple of students because the BT-13, if you had full flaps down and you put power on to go around if you weren't successful in your landing attempt, it had a tem tendency to go way nose up. So at night, students would forget to, to pull the flaps up while they were applying power so as not to get caught in a stall at maybe 50 feet in the air. Yeah. But a, a couple of guys killed themselves yeah. with that. Well, formation flying, acrobatics, the beginnings of instrument flying with a hood in the back seat. And, uh, and by the time I got done with basic flying school, I had maybe 120 hours or, or something like that. Got about 60 hours of, per school. Uh, hmm. I was then selected to be a fighter pilot. In basic, some of the men were selected to be bomber pilots and they transitioned uh, in, with, into twin engine Cessnas, I think they were. Uh, Cessna trainer, I've forgotten the, the, the number designation. But anyway, they were at that field also. And then I was gonna go to fighters, fighter school, so I went to Mariana, Florida to fly AT-6s. And the AT-6 <laughs> was also a ground looper. It, it, you put it on the runway and it, and it wouldn't roll straight. So the dominant practice was you put your feet up on the brakes on your final approach leg. 
to be ready to use the brakes to keep the AT6 rolling straight. <coughs> but AT6s, more formation, instrument training, and now we had to make instrument takeoffs from the back seat under a hood. And you had to keep it on the runway. So you lined it up, set the directional gyro to the runway heading, and then closed the hood. And then the instructor said, okay, you got it, now take it off. So you had to take it off and make a smooth takeoff and not hit any of the runway lights in the process and get it up up to altitude. And one, one, one of the practices in uh, AT6 instrument training was the instructor would take the controls and do acrobatics and you were under the hood and he did he sometimes leave you like this and shake the stick and say okay you got it, it. Yeah. so you had to you had to center the needle center the ball center the airspeed that was the procedure get it flying again and keep it level yeah and that was a a little bit of a thrill at times. Uh, did you ever have any uh, air sickness or motion sickness from all this? Yeah. Yeah. Did you yeah. struggle with that, or you get through uh, it? Or I got through it. No. I got through it, and I, I, I got used to it. Okay. Uh, and I was lucky. Some guys did. No. They they didn't get used to it. Well, one day, I was it was near graduation, and. I had to get a, some more time under the hood, so a uh, a WAF was my uh, lookout pilot, a ladies' air force pilot went into the front seat, and uh, I was in the back under the hood, and I I was so practicing. I don't know, fundamental things. But after she landed the airplane, she signed the Form 1A and handed it back to me to sign because I was the pilot in command. And she had written up relief tube used. Uh -oh. And she was wearing trousers. Yeah. And I could see part of her yeah. and I wasn't paying any attention and I sat there scratching my head and she laughed and just walked off <laughs> you don't remember her name do you no okay, okay. no I don't okay. but my 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 uh, other story was I took my acrobatic check ride with the squadron commander who was a major. He'd, he'd been in uh, Pearl Harbor and so on and was back in the training command. And as I was getting into the cockpit, he said, Mister, would you go get me a cup of water? Yes, sir. So I trotted off, I got him a cup of water, and he drank about half of it. And while I'm buckling myself in, I get myself hooked up with, now, electrical headsets and so on. Uh, he gets on the intercom and he says, Mr. You see this cup of water? If you spill a drop, you flunk. Okay. Well, a fighter pilot was supposed to fly acrobatics coordinated. That is, with keeping the ball in the middle, the uh, skid and slip ball. Yeah. 
You had to be able to do barrel rolls, loops, well, not Immelman's, because Immelman was a slow roll at the top of a loop, but a lot of maneuvers, you had to work at coordinating that airplane so that the ball was stayed in the middle. That is because in a fighter with fixed guns, if the ball is off to the side, your bullets are not going where you're aiming them. So that's how we had to do, and of course, he drank the water, but uh, he, he was the same guy that uh, just before I graduated, he took me up for my final check ride, and he said, Mr. I want you to go up to 15,000 feet, and I want you to put this airplane in a spin and hold it in a spin and count the turns until I tell you to pull out. And I'm counting turns. And that was, I've forgotten, 18 turns or something like that. And we get down to about 2,000 feet and he says, okay, mister, take it out take it out of the spin. So I kicked it out of the spin and I was thoroughly dizzy and I wonder what the hell was going on. He said, I just wanted to demonstrate to you that the AT-6 does not have a vicious spin. He demonstrated yes, all right. He yes. Well, he let me know that he had put me in for instructor training. Okay. So I went back to Mariana and I was teaching acrobatics and uh, formation, and I was waiting to go to instructor school. And there was, it was a month of that, and I, it was getting boring. And I don't know when it was, somewhere around VE day, no, 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 uh, the, the invasion, uh, that uh, I, I, I went to see him and I, I said, Sir, I want to go to combat. I, I just don't want to just do this. So I, was, I went down to Eglin Field for gunnery, and it was AT-6s shooting at uh, ground targets and sleeve targets with AT-6s. Then right after that, went to another auxiliary field where, well, where we were introduced to the P-40. Yeah, okay. I think I had, oh, I might have had 240 hours or something like that in military airplanes. And uh, we had to read the manual, which was a little thin, six by nine mimeograph book and uh, then we had to sit in the P-40 and, and uh, practice with a blindfold identifying everything in the cockpit so you could put your hands on it and then because the P-40 was a totally electric airplane why we had to uh, demonstrate that we could start the engine. But it was also the first engine that had an idle cutoff start, which meant that you, you uh, had the mixture control in the off position for no fuel to the engine, and you would prime it. And I think the P-40 had a plunger primer. I'm not sure of that. But prime it and then turn on the mags and uh, had an electric starter and started on the prime and the minute the engine started to run on the prime you push the mixture control up into up into what 
was supposed to be automatic rich because there was a stop in the mixture control quadrant to keep you from putting it into full rich although full rich was something that we never used anyway anyway the instructor at the time I was starting that engine was standing on the wing the minute the doggone engine caught and started running he was on the ground he pulled the chocks and said go oh <laughs> this is June 90 degrees and you had to taxi rather fast because you had to keep the engine from overheating because now it's a liquid cooled engine so the P40 didn't want to roll straight either so when you went to S it so you could see where where you were going down the taxiway you practically had to stand on the opposite rudder pedal to keep it from winding up into a ground loop right. okay. so I, I got to the end of the runway and I the, the coolant temperature was still in the green but my legs were shaking they were just shaking from the from the effort of keeping that thing going well anyway I took off you're alone in the aircraft now, right? Um, you're, yeah, yeah, no duel. No, no duel. That's right. You're all alone. You're there. Yeah. <laughs> no duel. Well, I, I think I went about five miles before I pulled the landing gear up. <laughs> and we took off without flaps. And uh, oh, I started climbing and climbing. And somehow it didn't seem like it wanted to climb real well. And uh, I got to about 6,000 feet, and there was black smoke coming out of the stacks. And I'm looking at all the temperatures, uh, oil cooler, coolant temperature, uh, cylinder head temperature. I was looking for something wrong, and everything looked good. And then I just happened to touch the mixture control, and it went click back into automatic rich and the airplane took yes, off. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you learned, right. But the, those were war weary uh, P-40s and uh, a couple of guys put them in the fields because the engines uh, were not very reliable. Yeah. They were the Allison's and they were old. Yeah. And Allison was <clears throat> Congress's uh, baby, yeah. General Motors. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's a long story. Yeah. That needn't be published right now. But uh, anyway, I got about I don't know 20 hours in the P40, and I was shipped up to uh, the first Air Force, and that was Richmond, Virginia, as the uh, reception field for the. First Air Force, and then I went, went up to Bradley Field, and uh, I'm my home is Long Island. I'm at Bradley Field. I went home on weekends. That, that, yeah. that was that was neat, but Bradley Field was Thunderbolt. But it was called Bradley Field then because yeah, that's where Bradley put the P40 into the. Uh, that was earlier in. in uh, Right, the, the airport got named after him for. Oh, is that right? Yes, that's oh, named after. Oh, for heaven's sakes! Uh, well, named Bradley then. Yeah. Bradley Field was camouflaged with uh, netting. Yes. To look like a tobacco field, right. and the netting was painted across the runways. Oh, really? So that the day I first flew a Thunderbolt which is now a, a Razorback C model or something, uh, was a September warm, hazy day. And I couldn't find a field. And I called the tower and I said, I'm in the vicinity, but I can't find the field. And the tower laughed and he said, all right, you go down to Hartford, come up the river, and when you get to a sandbar in the river, you turn to a heading of 300 degrees yeah. and get down as low as you can, and you will see 
there is a flat spot in the netting, and that's the runway. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, my God. You know what? I've, I've got 4,500 hours in Moonies flying them all over the country. Yeah. And one day I made an instrument approach on Bradley Field and that very same runway and I went right over the very same sandbar. It's Isn't still it? there awesome. in the river. That's wonderful. <laughs> That's, yes. Well, so you're flying a Thunderbolt now, right? Yeah. At Bradley, okay. Yeah, at Bradley. Yeah. And that was, that was uh, fun. You know, I, I arrived there on, around Labor Day weekend, and I was, I think it was Friday night, I went to see the CEO, and he was at the Officers Club bar, and I was talking to him, and I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to go down to Richmond to, to see a gal, and uh, I wanted to borrow an A-24, Douglas Dauntless Dive Bomber. Yeah. And they had them as, as transition airplanes at, on Bradley. Oh, I don't know, I had got about six hours in it or something like that. I wanted to go down to Richmond. Anyway, I'm talking to the CO, and I, I said, Major, what does a Thunderbolt fly like? And his answer with a smile was, well, if it flies like an airplane, fly it like an airplane. If it flies like a fighter, God bless you, have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> great, great plan, yes. Yeah, well, I don't know how many hours. Uh, by then, I, I, I've forgotten. I probably had 300 hours or something like that. And they shipped me to uh, Suffolk Air Base for gunnery. Mm -hmm. And this was so October of 44, yeah. something like that. And one day, one day I was supposed to uh, just practice laying down a smoke screen. And the wind, the wind was blowing from the west. And normally, anything we did close to the ground, like ground targets, shooting ground targets, dropping bombs, that kind of thing, uh, <coughs> would be done in a, in a field that was west of uh, Suffolk Air Base. But the wind was blowing from the west and the tower was concerned about my smoke screen blowing over the, over the field. So he said, why don't you go down to the beach and put it down on top of the waves, right where they break. So I'm tooling along with two smoke screen tanks. I'm down to about 10 feet of altitude and probably doing 200 knots or something. And I passed some fishermen, fishing, uh, surf fishing uh, around the Hamptons somewhere. And uh, I had gone past them with the smoke screen. And I said, boy, that's interesting. So I cut off the smoke screen. I went out to sea about four or five miles climbed up to about five, 6,000 feet, maybe more, and then dove down to get a lot of speed. And I broke through the smoke screen just off the ground, right at the fisherman, going about 300 miles an hour. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you woke them up, didn't you? Yeah, so much for fishing. Oh, yeah, you had, you had to have a little fun. Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. And then we were, sh the other thing that happened to me was we were shooting gunnery, that's now sleeve targets, yeah. where they tow the, uh, the tow plane, 
uh, I've forgotten what it was. It might have been in 86, but I'm not sure of that. But the tow plane would tow the target about a mile out over the ocean, parallel to Long Island beaches, from Fire Island to Montauk Point, and then turn around and come back. And we were we would fly along with the uh, tow plane, or in opposite directions, depending upon the exercise of the day, from 10,000 feet, and then peel off and make a firing pass at the target. And your bullets were painted, so when the target got back to the field, they could tell how many hits you had. Well, I'm, I'm at 10,000 feet and I'm about to make a pass and I decided that I probably ought to switch gas tanks before I do this. That Thunderbolt had two internal tanks. I don't remember. Yeah, I think it might have had an auxiliary also. Anyway, I switched tanks and started my my run and the engine quit. Dead, completely dead. It wouldn't start, it wouldn't start. And I was above Jones Beach. Now Jones Beach has a parkway on the north shore of it that was really a four-lane highway mm -hmm. with an island in between. And I said, okay, I'm going to have to stick this thing down on that road. And uh, all the while I'm gl gliding down and I'm talking to the tower, telling them, I can't get it started, I can't get it started. I'm going to have to stick it down on the road at Jones Beach. Would you notify the police? The highway department. Yeah, yeah that, that I'm going to do that. Well. I probably got down to 50 feet and the damn engine started again. Wow. Uh, I, uh, so I called the tower. I said, hey, the engine decided to run again. And I was down to about 50 feet. He says, I, I think you better come home right away. So I went back home. Well, I uh, seems like I... I had a calm voice when all of this was going on, and uh, so there were many toasts at the officers' club that sure. night. <laughs> Excellent. But after that, it was uh, where the port of embarkation in New Jersey. Uh, oh, I've forgotten the name of it. The army base in Brunswick, New Brunswick. New Jersey. Not Camp Shanks. I'm sorry? Camp Shanks? No. That's, no, I that's don't think over, so. Yeah, anyway, the so yeah. then yeah. then I was I, I was shipped shipped to go overseas. Okay. And uh, left New York Harbor on the HMT Volendam uh, sometime around the middle of uh, January. I, I don't remember the date, but uh, arrived in uh, Gourke, Scotland, and uh, we all thought, well, there were six, oh yeah, there were six of us aboard, six fighter pilots were aboard with a bunch of troops. So all the fighter pilots got army jobs. I became the ship's gunnery officer. That was my job going across to Scotland. I didn't get a lot of sleep, yeah. except in the daytime. Yeah. But we arrived in Scotland, and uh, then I got orders to go to the 56th Fighter Group. Now, we all thought we were going to go into a Thunderbolt outfit in the Ninth Air Force and, and do uh, ground support work. But no, I was, I was shipped to the 56th Fighter Group and I was assigned to the 61st Fighter Squadron. Mm -hmm. 
and then well the next thing was more schooling it was operational training and we had to learn tactics and uh, do a lot of aircraft recognition at 1 25th of a second but what we also had to do was we had to look at the pictures, aerial photographs, of cities in France and Germany at a 25th of a second. Yeah. And we had to recognize them, yeah. and we had to know what the heading was home and how much gas you needed to get home. Wow. So you couldn't get us lost. We didn't use any charts. Yeah. We just knew it like the back of our neighborhood, you know, the back of your hand. Uh, oh, the final test in uh, that schooling was they gave you a blank map of Europe and you had to draw in all, all the rivers wow. and uh, put in the uh, principal cities and so on. Man. You guys had requirements like well <laughs> no wonder you know that the bomber guys at this point in time were no longer navigating there was a lead bomber yeah. that did the navigation for the whole mission so a lot of the times they were lost if they got out of formation mm -hmm. and they'd get on the radio and call for little friends little friends you know yeah. you know and they describe where they w what they saw on the ground, yeah. and we were obliged to try to help them. Yeah. Well, one day in a mission, uh, I guess we we all got scattered, and I was going home alone, and. Uh, uh, I heard somebody calling on 8th Air Force common frequency because that was if you were alone you didn't try you know, you tried to, to get your buddies and see if you could join up with them but as a last resort you'd call 8th Air Force and tell them where you were and what you were doing so I heard this bomber and they, he was close to where I was so I helped him home and happily uh, there weren't any German fighters around, so we got home all right. Well, I, I had a day off. We got two days off every two weeks, and we had an apartment in London. Where the, were you based, Ernie? Where was your... Uh, beg where, pardon? Where were you based? Oh, in, sorry. In yeah, this was Boxstead, England, Okay. in uh, East Anglia. Boxstead. Okay. Uh, okay. So you had an apartment in London. Yeah, we had an apartment in London. So I had I had the next day off. So naturally, go down to London and have a little fun. And I didn't know where to eat because I didn't know a heck of a lot about London at that point in time. So I went to the officers' mess in uh, oh one of the big hotels in London and uh, as a fighter pilot as a, uh, we wore blue patches under our wings mm -hmm. that that meant that we were combat crew and that a uh, air raid warden couldn't order you into a bomb shelter you you were on your on own. Your own. Okay. You were on your own. Yeah. Well, I had the blue patch, so I got my tray of food at 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 the officers' mess, and uh, there was a round table with about six pilots at it, and I sat down and uh, started talking to them. They were all bomber <laughs> guys, and uh, as it turns out couple of them 
were the one the guys I ferried home Is that right? the day before. Oh, that's so something. Needless to say, I had enough to drink that Absolutely. night. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'll bet you did. Yes. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Huh. Well. Isn't that something? But uh, I, uh, people ask me, how many missions did you fly? That's just where I was going. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, uh, I don't know about the other Air Forces, but I believe it was 8th Air Force where fighter pilots had a tour of duty of 250 hours. Okay. And I had, I don't know, 120 hours, something like that. So at, at an average length of mission, and near the end of the war, we were doing six hours routinely going to Berlin and everything else. So just say, okay, average hours uh, of four, perhaps, uh, that turns out to be, uh, what, 60 missions? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, could be less. And, <laughs> yeah, one, one mission was the, the Raymogen Bridge incident. As I understand it, the Ninth Air Force couldn't get off the ground because of weather okay. on that day. And we were ordered to go to the Raymogen Bridge and take care of anything that needed taking care of. Well, we went in on we went in on the deck. It was a battle formation at five hundred feet and we were on the deck and I was flying yellow four. Yellow four was the fourth the fourth uh Flight. This was now battle formation. Flight leader, wingman, uh, element leader, wingman. Yellow four. Yeah, I'm shaking. Yellow four was way out. We were spread out, line abreast. I was way at the end. And yellow four's job was always to listen to Eighth Air Force uh, channels. Yeah. We had four channels in the uh, VHF uh, radio. It was. Yellow Force job to listen to Eighth Air Force in case there were any orders. Okay. Well, I was Yellow Four, and I'm way out, nobody to my left, and I'm looking around, wondering, no Luftwaffe, yeah. they're not, they're not getting off the ground either. Yeah. And then I looked and I saw something coming out of the clouds, going like hell. It was a red P-38, a recon airplane, okay. coming down out of the clouds. And it looks like he was, he dove into the clouds to get away from some Germans. And there were two Fock Wolves following him, trying to catch him. And he must have seen our formation. And this guy pushes the button, 8th Air Force Common, he pushes the button and says, look to Lockheed for leadership. <laughs> they disappeared. Yeah. I never saw them again. Yeah. We didn't do anything. We just milled around there for a while and then went back home. So that was, that was a non-incident. And a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the missions were really milk grunts. You, you sat there for hours and hours and hours and uh, there wasn't anything happening. Or you'd get, you'd get bounced by uh, ME 262s, the oh, jets, yes, yes, the a couple jets. of them. Because yeah. they, were, they were the only airplanes that the, the Germans had that could get up to the 30,000s and still have some speed. Okay. All, all of the, uh, all of the uh, German engines had, uh, gear-driven turbines, and that they could only pull maximum power for the last time at something like uh, 22 or 24,000 feet. Mm -hmm. But the jets now, the 262s, they could get up to 35,000 feet. 
Were there many of them out there at, at the? Uh, no. No. Yeah, they didn't. They yeah. didn't know how to fight with them. Yeah. They didn't know how to fight with an airplane that was so fast that it couldn't turn and shoot in front of anybody else. Yeah. All right. So what we used to do when when they attack us is we'd break to meet them head on. You'd call a break, and that was standard. Yeah. That was standard procedure. Turn, and that's why we were spread out, so we could all turn. Uh, turn and meet the enemy head on. Yeah, okay. Well, with the 262s, uh, by the time you got turned around, they were gone. Yeah. So we used to start, start a break and knew that they couldn't hit us because they were going too fast. And then as soon as they started to pass us, we'd straighten out and take a shot at them, take a pot shot at them. Yeah. But they, they'd make one pass and they were gone. Yeah. yeah. But so you were going up every day then, probably. Um, then, no. No. Where? What is it now? Is it we well, the forty-five? Is it still forty-four? Well, it's, it's, we're in the forty-five, aren't we? What's that? The year. Oh yeah, yeah. There's forty-five. Right yeah. Yeah. We had troubles early on with the airplane. Uh, this was now the P-47M. We got. We got all the M's that Republic made, and it had an extra powerful, uh, probably the most the most powerful R2800 uh, engine that Pratt and Whitney ever made, and it was a C version, and we had the big uh, GE exhaust turbines okay so we could draw full power all the way up to 35,000 feet and that was 3300 horsepower at that altitude and that was a 2800 horsepower engine yeah. and republic made 130 of them and uh, it, it was it was dave schilling who was the group commander, and, uh, oh, by the way, the group was called Zemke's Wolf Pack. Yes, I read about that. Yeah, yes, yes. okay. Well, Schilling was the group commander then, and Dave Schilling, uh, and most of, the, most of the brass did not want P-51s. But when we had engine troubles, they flew in some P-51s and we were supposed to transition and fly them on missions and so on. And we flew them a couple of times and Schilling said, no, take them away. Yeah, yeah. We, want, we want the M's fixed so that they run good. Okay, okay. So we finally, of course, got them running good. And what also happened was the tech reps that uh, were there to cure the engine problems, one of which was it ran too cool. So coming home from missions, engines would quit because they'd, they'd, uh, you'd be running them lean and low power yeah. to save fuel. And they would quit, and then you'd have to start them, which they readily started, but uh, then you had to run it with, on more power, and you'd be sweating gas for sure. But uh, they, they fixed the cooling problem, and they ran warmer. But they said, look, you got so much extra cooling in those engines, you can take a little more uh, manifold pressure than what you're now getting mm -hmm. by just running the turbine a little faster. So the, uh, the machinists in the bunch, uh, I think they worked on the uh, turbine speed cams and got more more manifold pressure. Okay. okay. The engine was rated at 2,800 horses at, uh, I think it was 84, 85 
inches of manifold pressure with 15 minutes of water injection mm -hmm. to take the place of the uh, uh, take the place of the extra gas that would be needed to ke keep the engine from detonating. Yeah. Uh, well, they boosted the turbines up to 95 inches, and I know one guy was uh, able to get 100 inches of mercury into that engine, yeah. and at 35,000 feet. That was an, that particular airplane, that was an honest 500 miles an hour. Wow. And the best, of, the best a uh, P-51 ever did, I think was something like between four, 450 or, mm -hmm. and 470, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. Well, that was some airplane. Were you using drop tanks then, or? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 500 gallons 500. externally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you'd uh, you'd run the drop tanks until they were empty. You actually waited for the engine to quit, and then you would switch to internal gas, and then switch to the other drop tank okay. and run it out of gas. Yeah. Yeah. And then you'd you'd just pull the lever and yeah. drop them. You did drop them, though, right? Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh yeah. Well, well, most of the time we were over Germany yeah. when we did that. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, no, I think on one mission, I think I logged six and a half hours, and the, I, I just about turned off the runway and the engine quit. <laughs> <laughs> you cut, the, cut it close, right. Well, that's great. Well, the, uh, the standard approach if, if, if we returned intact, the, the squadron, if we returned intact, and it happened frequently, mm -hmm. uh, we would s spread out four flights, three flights, or five flights, whatever, and get in trail, four airplanes at a time, and the, the formation, this guy, wingman, would fly out here to have an echelon, and the, the uh, lead, the flight leader would take the flight down to about, oh, 500 feet, and maybe about 300 miles an hour, and then we'd peel up and, and fan out, fan out uh, for a, a, a turning approach. Mm -hmm. And we made turning approaches. And it was called a widowmaker pattern. And uh, flight leaders used to pride themselves on being able to break, to break for the landing, and put it down in 45 seconds. So most of the time, when I was landing, I was turning, and we were obliged to land at 45 degrees from the guy in front of you. You know, on one side of the runway and the other, and alternate. And uh, it was always the squadron commander's uh, objective to land his fighters fast enough that the last guy would be touching down when he was turning off the runway. Wow. <laughs> now, how many guys were you? How many? Fighters were in a. Uh, would it depend on the mission or, or how big well, it was? Well, it, it was three squadrons. Okay. Sixty first, sixty second, sixty third, and a standard flight. And you rarely had a standard. Uh, not not. A standard. Uh, mission. Or? Yeah, mission. Uh, squadron uh, mission would be. Uh, 16 airplanes, okay. four flights. Sometimes, if you had enough airplanes, you'd put five flights up. Sometimes, you'd put up three because airplanes were down for one reason or sure. another. Yeah. And uh, so, we used to take off the, the same way. Yeah. And uh, I have a painting that I want to show you okay. of a typical takeoff. 
group thing, right? Huh? In, a, in a, a yeah, we we would we would take off. We would we would assemble on the uh, uh, downwind end of the the runway in flight formation with the flight leader hugging the left boundary of the runway, his wingman tucked in to the gun barrels, the element leader hugging the right-hand edge of the runway, his wingman tucked into the gun barrels, and we took off two at a time, Jeez. and there was a, a an officer waving us on to, to start to start to take off, and he'd wait until the flight before you was about 45 degrees to you, and then he'd wave you. So it was the flight leader's job to keep that flight at 45 degrees. Good idea, yeah. The other, the other thing was, the flight leader was not allowed to get his wheels off the ground until his wingman was already flying and already had his wheels coming up. Wow. Okay? Then the flight leader could uh, retract his gear, and the wingman, after taking off, would fly slightly higher, yeah. uh, just so that whatever the flight leader cleared on his takeoff, the wingman was sure to clear. Yeah. The, uh, squadron commander would go about five five miles upwind, make a 180 turn, and the rest of the squadron on the mission would form up on him as he was passing the airfield. So once he was past the airfield, we were all formed up, and if there were 16 airplanes, why? The airplanes would be like this. And the squadron commander would fly instruments through the ever-present clouds, and we would fly off the squadron commander. And everybody kept everybody in sight. And many times, many times the, uh, the clouds were 10,000 feet or so, and we'd just climb on through. Now, the three squadrons, there were three runways. The three squadrons would take off on different runways, and the second squadron to take off would fly the mission heading, mm -hmm. going through the clouds. The first to take off flew a little bit to the north, like five degrees or less, yeah. and the last squadron, the third squadron, would fly a little to the south, going through the clouds. Wow. Yeah. So when you broke out, you broke out in the clear, and most of the time you could see each other. That you don't get a chance to practice that. You got this is your experience. Oh yeah, this you do your, it. You just do it. You yeah, do it. Yeah. That's right. That's, oh, that, that. So when I see pictures of those planes, fighters stacked up there, they didn't do that for the camera. That's that's how they fly. Yeah, that's, that's right. The, but the minute we got above the clouds, we'd spread out in battle formation, okay. which was nearly a uh, line abreast. Okay. So that the whole group, you know, 48 airplanes, would be flying approximately okay. line abreast. So we could all turn, we could all yeah. intercept oh. whatever was going on. Okay. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, one of my stories. In the States, practicing fighter tactics and so on, it uh, became mandatory to use a, some standard phraseology, and you had to practice calling in other airplanes in the sky. Mm -hmm. Well, in the States, it would be airliners and other military airplanes. And you, you, had, you had to always say it the same. Uh, red leader, this is red four, 
uh, two bogeys, six o'clock high, or two bogeys wherever they were, whatever the, the position was. So you got you got used to doing that. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm on my first mission, and my feet are freezing, and I it was minus 65 degrees, yeah, man. The, and the heater was for nothing. You know, it didn't do much, but the sun's heat at, at 35,000 feet yeah. was substantial. So, Did you see our phone huh? Yeah. Yeah, but there's not. I think it. it's outside. Anyway, uh, hi. My feet were so cold, I was stamping them, and and uh, I was miserable. And I heard in the, in the in the in the earphones somebody push the mic button. You could hear it. Shh, shh, shh. Then all of a sudden the voice comes on. Jesus Christ, Messerschmitt! Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the heck with the procedure. Yeah. You know what? My feet were warm for the rest that's of the right. mission. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, that's... So, and and uh, that, if if you've read the, uh, what is it? Beware the thunderbolt. I'm I'm on the air. I'm being photographed. Oh. Somebody want me? No. Oh, okay. Uh, wanted me. Huh? They wanted me, but I said I was being photographed. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> Excellent. Anyway, the, on the 13th of April, we were to go on a fighter sweep. Now, because we had the airplanes we had, uh, a lot of the last end of the war, we were on fighter sweeps, which was what Jimmy Doolittle authorized. There was a time when you weren't allowed to leave the bombers, mm -hmm. but Jimmy Doolittle uh, turned the fighters loose. He allowed them to, to go on fighter sweeps, and then it became a standard mission. We would take off, uh, and just fly into Germany under radar guidance. And radar, if they saw any German fighters, would put us up sun and higher altitude, yeah. and then it was our job to bust them up. Yeah. Not stay and fight with them, just to uh, discourage them, let's say. Yeah. Okay. And you, know, you you got to shoot a little bit. Right. Anyway, so that the fighters would be on the ground when getting gas when the bombers were making their bombing run. Oh, okay. So okay. We, were, we were on a fighter sweep, 13th of April, and I was flying Vic Bast's wing. Now, Vic Bast was... Uh, my my flight leader at that time, and I think we were D flight. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was flying Vic Bass wing, and Vic had just been made assistant operations officer because he was the, the ranking captain, and also he had the most experience. And we were supposed to go to the South Pacific and Vic was going to be the squadron commander. Mm -hmm. uh, in preparation, I went to intelligence school in London with the British because no ground officers were going to go to the Pacific with us. Yeah. So we had to do some ground jobs. Anyway, I'm flying Vic's wing, and Jim Carter, who was the... Uh, yeah, he was, Jim Carter was the squadron commander then. He was a major. Uh, had, had a problem with an engine. So he aborted the mission and he appointed Vic to lead the squadron. So I'm flying Vic's wing. 
but I don't know who the group commander was, but he ordered us to do top cover if if anything happened and we, we got some action. Well, anyway, we get into Germany, uh, Nutmeg, Nuthouse. Nuthouse was the radar uh, outfit. Nuthouse said, uh, there aren't any fighters up in the air. Uh, we have a, a ground target for you. Go to Egbeck Airdrome in southern Denmark. There are a lot of German airlines uh, sequestered there. Go shoot it up. So we went to Egbeck Airdrome. Well, Vic, Vic and his flight, me included, we're flying top cover and the group commander and the other squadron commander, they go down and they start shooting up the place. Well, Vic reports a paragraph in Beware the Thunderbolt, okay. where uh, he said, they finally let us go down and do something, and they left something for us to shoot at. <laughs> well, the group we shot up, we destroyed 95 German airplanes that day. Jeez. Wow. wow. Yeah. 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 Productive day, yes. Uh, I got three and three destroyed, five damaged, and I had a gun camera film that the 8th Air Force Museum was going to use and they couldn't get it to run okay. so. to, to make a digital copy. Yeah. But that, that film shows that I flew through one of the explosions, one of the JU-88s oh. that I had blew up. Yeah, I've seen film of that sort of thing yeah. where the fighter goes right, yeah, right yeah. down through its destruction. Yeah. And Boy, did we sweat gas going home that day. Yeah, man. That was all the way from Denmark. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I think I'd like to take a break. Okay, well, let's... Yeah. Do we want to wrap it up? At, uh, uh, I, I think don't know. We've, we've been going for over two hours now. Wow. So, oh, huh? that's enough. Yeah. That's enough. Well, let's... Let's wrap this up, and there is, there's no reason that we can't talk okay, further sure. at a future date. But sure. uh, I want to say at this point, uh, uh, it's been a pleasure and it's been an honor to meet you and be here today to hear about uh, flying in the 56th and uh, alongside the 8th Air Force and your, uh, your war experiences. So, Ernie Treff, I thank you, and the Veterans History Project thanks you and the Library of Congress thanks you. So, <laughs> you are welcome. Thank you. Okay. I'm very happy to talk. Okay. Thank you. All um, right. So we, the other story. Okay. You're, you're talking about now after the war you did what? After the war <clears throat> I first off flew AT-6s again at uh, Mitchell Field on Long Island. Okay. But uh, then I uh, was lucky to get accepted by the the New York Air National Guard at, uh, uh, oh, uh, White Plains Airport. Okay. And uh, they were flying 47s at that time. And then we got brand new 51s that came out of uh, mothballs. And these were 51Ks. And it was a nice airplane to fly but the engine was a terror. Mm -hmm. We had to run those 51s at full bore every 30 minutes, that is full throttle, to clean up the plugs. Otherwise, they'd quit on you. Yeah. And the reason I only found out recently was that the engines, both the, the Rolls-Royce Merlin and the uh, 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 hmm, Allison, General Motors Allison, both the engines were designed for full power operation on 100 octane gas. Okay. And then 
when they started getting more power out of internal combustion engines, uh, the so-called octane rating was insufficient to support the power they were getting out of the engines. Mm -hmm. So they started putting tetraethyl lead in the fuel yeah. to raise the grade up to 130 or 150. Yeah. The Pratt & Whitney's handled this with aplomb, yeah. but the, uh, the inline engines, both, them, both of them, uh, they would lead plugs. Yeah. And you had to be extra careful that any time the engine started getting a little rough, you had to put on full power yeah. for at least two minutes. Well, we used to take off and go down the Floyd Bennett field, saving our full power time. Floyd Bennett was flying Navy airplanes, and we'd go looking for Navy, and then use our full power up. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, there, there was like about a little less than 500 hours in P-51s with the Air Guard. We used to chase a Russian recon airplane out of New York State about once every two months. Mm -hmm. That was before the dew line was finished. Okay. Uh, that, that was always a thrill yeah. in the middle of the night yeah. going up the Merritt Parkway as, <laughs> as fast as you could drive. Yeah. But uh, the came out oh but, well we used to we used to race Kane with those 51s. Uh, you, you, on a calm day you could get a 51 if there were two of you. You could get a 51 to the point where you pull a rooster tail out of the water without touching it on Long Island Sound and then go through sailboat races. Jesus. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, did you, did you maintain contact with uh, any of your, your uh, yes. squadron after uh, reunions yes. and that sort of reunions, thing? Reunions, of yes. course. There's Vic Bass who's still alive. He stayed in. Okay. He stayed in. He's, he lives in, uh, in the summertime in o Oconto, uh, uh, Oconto, no, same state as Milwaukee. Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yeah. Oconto, Wisconsin, which is just north of Green Bay. Okay. And uh, I think he's in the phone book. Okay. And he'd be glad to talk to you. Sure. And he's, now, I noticed uh, on the website there was a recent uh, reunion at Windsor Locks at Bradley Field. Did you yes. go to that one? Yes, I did. Okay, I have, so you're in I have photographs of that yes, one. Yes, yes, I saw that on the website. I yeah. It's great that, uh, yeah. that you guys get together. Yeah. Yeah, well, I went to, to se several of the uh, of the reunions. Uh, most interesting one was uh, the one in Phoenix, Arizona. Okay. At, uh, what's the name of the field, Pete? Luke. Huh? Luke. Luke, yeah. Luke Air Force Base. Yeah. And as far as I know, the 56th Fighter Group, including the 61st Squadron, is at Luke Air Force Base, and they are Top Gun guys. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, boy. But we had a reunion at Luke. How wonderful. Oh, great. And I, I, I flew the airplane I used on business, my Mooney. I flew my Mooney into uh, oh, boy. Phoenix, okay. Arizona. All right. So, yes, after I started flying again somewhere around, oh, 77, 78, when I went to a wedding with a friend in his airplane in Florida. And when we went, when we were in Florida, he said, okay, now we're going to go flying. I want you to see what an airplane is like these days. And, and this was a, uh, uh, what was it? It was a Piper Arrow, I think, that he he had. So on Sunday after the wedding, he puts me in a left seat. I said, oh, come on, John, you're crazy. 
He says, oh, go on, get in the left seat. I'll run the engine, you fly the airplane. Well, it flew all right. And uh, I got over the water a, a couple of thousand feet. And I said, John, would it be all right uh, if, if I did some coordination exercises with this airplane? He says, yeah, sure, go ahead. So I started doing steep turns and shondells and lazy eights and that kind of thing. And I look over at John and he's white knuckles. Uh, I said, John, am I disturbing you? He said, you SOB, five minutes in this airplane and you wear it like a glove. <laughs> and what year was that, Ernie? That was about 78, I think. 1978 and you're doing it. You're After that, I started, I started renting his airplane yeah. to fly on business, and then uh, in 81 or so, I bought a Mooney. Oh boy, okay. Well, yeah. on the way home from the wedding, we were obliged to stop at Norfolk for fuel. So, I'm flying the airplane now. John says, come on, you're going to fly at home. Anyway, I'm going to land it at in Norfolk, and the tower says, follow that Mooney in. And I looked at John, and I, I said, hey, what's a Mooney? He says, look at it. The tail leans forward. Yeah. You know, he's, he's, the tower said, follow that Mooney in. Well, I saw that Mooney on the ground, because I parked near it, and boy, I fell in love with it. <laughs> so I had to have a Mooney. Yeah, excellent. And, I'll show you the pictures. I look forward to it, yes, yes. I'll show you the pictures of the Moonies. Okay. We had two of them. All right. We had one that I flew for 4,000 some odd hours, wow. put three engines in it, and then uh, I bought a 231 uh, Redo, which had a tuned and ported engine in it, and it was rated for 28,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And it actually trued out at 200 knots at 28,000 feet. Oh. And it had eight hours of fuel. Okay, there you go. I, I took off over gross many times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Anyway, so well. that's that's that's, that's the story that's flying. of flying. Okay. Well, again, I say thank you, and uh, it's been an honor, a real oh, honor yeah. to meet you and and, and uh, share these stories with you. So, and uh, Pete wasn't wrong, was he? Pete was. I I couldn't stop talking. Yeah, well, <laughs> Ernie, it's a pleasure, real a real pleasure, and a, and a thrill to meet you. And, and uh, yes, of, same of all here. the veterans I've interviewed, uh, your stories are. Uh, really, really different than anyone I've ever <laughs> talked to. So. You left a couple out, too. Well, yeah. <laughs> we'll just have to get back to it. Anyway, thank you so much. You're welcome. And your th thank you from You're the welcome. Veterans History Project. Right. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, Ernie just remembered something he forgot to tell me. One of the missions at Bradley Field <clears throat> was a low-level cross-country navigation mission. We had to stay below 500 feet above the ground and fly a triangular course. Okay. And the, the, the course was up to Albany from Bradley, down to Poughkeepsie, and then back to Bradley Field. Okay. Well, I got up to Albany, and there are hills all around, so I got down on the Hudson River, and I was mm, down about, you know, 20, 30 feet off the and ground. Are you flying now? P-47. P-47, okay. I was, yeah, it was part of the training uh, of P-47. Yeah. And uh, I've gone down the Hudson River, and I, I come to the Bear Mountain Bridge. And I say, hmm, do I go over it or do I go under it? <laughs> Well, I went under it, okay. and as I went under it, I looked up and, oh boy, I got a lot of room here. Now, 
I happened to have a brand new P47. I think it was a, a D23 or something like that that hadn't had the numbers painted on the wings yet. It was still unpainted. And it also still had the water injection uh, attached. So I went under the bridge and I said, hmm, I wonder if I could do a loop around it. So I, so I climbed up. I climbed up and accidentally started the water injection while I was climbing up. But I climbed up to, oh, I don't know, seven, 8,000 feet and dove down and went under the bridge at about 400 and something miles an hour, then pulled it up to a loop. And while I was upside down, I kept it inverted climbing just to make enough room so that I could then go down under it again. I did that. There were guards on the bridge. There were guards on the bridge that reported that one of the thunderbolts he saw go by did a loop around the bridge. Oh my God. So I got back and the, uh, there were four of us with unmarked airplanes. The CO calls us in to his office. And uh, well, he, he's reading us out. He's really giving us the baloney. One of you guys did a loop around the Bear Mountain Bridge today, and I want you to tell me who that is. And we're standing there with our mouths shut tight. Nobody's talking. And uh, uh, he, he quit bawling us out after a while and then said, if I find out and can prove who did that, his tail end is gone from here. Well, I'm about to close the door behind me, and he says, come here. Tomorrow morning, you and I are going up as a flight. We're going up to 30,000 feet. You're going to fly my wing, and then I'm going to put you in trail. You are to stay on my tail regardless of what I do. And he did everything he knew how to do in a thunderbolt. And I stayed on his tail. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we get back down on the ground. He said, that was a nice job. Come on, I'll buy you a drink. And he buys me a drink and he says, did you use any water in that thunderbolt you were in? I said, yes, accidentally. He said, hmm, that's why you flew with me today. And he didn't, <laughs> he, he didn't say anything else. Oh, wonderful. I mean, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. What a great story. Uh, he, 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 was, he knew what was going yeah. on. I'm but, sure whoever else was on the bridge that day is still talking about it. I'll bet. I, I'll, I'll bet. bet. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Ernie. Yeah.